Hello, my name is Sunita Sarangi. Today, I am going to reflect on how the all-pervasive machine learning models can handle differences between training and test distributions. As you all know, machine learning models are now deeply entrenched in our day-to-day -day lives. They are used in a wide variety of applications across many different data modalities. But in spite of the diversity of their usage, the core principle behind training a machine learning model is these are being simple. So the basic premise in, of machine learning training is that there is a latent unobserved distribution between the inputs X and the outputs that you would like to see. And during training, you are just given some finite number of samples from that distribution. And your goal is to get an estimate of the conditional distribution of the output label, which is Y, given the input X. Now, this estimate is handled in practice through a two-step procedure. First, we come up with a function, typically a differentiable function, uh, F, which has parameters theta, and we estimate the parameters of the theta using the well-known maximum likelihood principle, which means that we find the thetas for which the probability or the likelihood of the training data is maximized. Now, why is this a good idea? By maximizing the likelihood on the samples of, a, of the latent distribution that we see in the training data, we can provide guarantees on how well the model will perform when faced with new instances which are drawn from the same latent distribution. So the whole premise of learnability is that you deploy the model on samples which are drawn from the same distribution on which the model has been trained. Now, this is a very reasonable assumption in the classical setting where machine learning models were deployed in controlled environments of say within an enterprise or within a lab. So there you had strict control on what the, the, on the data which was used for training and the data on which the model will be deployed. But now with the you know, huge success of machine learning, more and more machine learning models are getting deployed in the wild, <coughs> where the person or enterprise which trains the model is not necessarily the enterprise or the lab or the user who uses the model. And then it's really important to consider how we would train our models differently if the distribution on which it is deployed is different from the distribution on which it is trained. And uh, our focus is going to consider changes which are natural, gradual changes like the kinds which human beings would not even notice. You don't even need to do vipassana to understand that change is fundamental to life and any robust human being should be, uh, should be, you should not get too adversely affected in the face of change. And uh, we are not even talking about major changes like earthquakes or market crashes or COVID. The alarming part is that in spite of the huge success of machine learning, of deep learning models on data which are drawn from the same distribution, their robustness to change is not so great. So I am going to demonstrate that with some experiences we had within uh, my own research group. So here was an experiment that we did on the task of automatic speech recognition. So we evaluated a uh, modern uh, you know, ASR model, which has been trained on by some estimate, maybe say 50,000 hours of data. And we tested it under two different um, deployment scenarios. One where you test on speakers, which have uh, say US like accent. 
And there we found that the word error rate was around 13%. So these tests were done on a well-known uh, benchmark, which is called this Mozilla Common Voice data set, where for the same sentence, we have utterances from speakers with, uh, from many different regions. And now when we tested this model on uh, speakers with say an Indian accent, we got a uh, whooping 22% word error rate. And on speakers with an Australian accent, we got 23% word error rate. So this basically demonstrates the lack of robustness of a large scale trained model on changes which you would expect is natural, which is the changes which come out of spatial um, you know, change of the speaker. Uh, now, the second example we did was with an handwriting recognition task. So this was a much smaller scale model. So we trained a, a model to recognize individual characters from a, a set of like say five, six different Indian languages. And uh, this is one example where we trained a model on Tamil, which is an Indian language. Uh, and uh, the handwriting was over, uh, collected from 50 different people. And on uh, more samples which were drawn from the same set of 50 people, if we tested the model, we got around 90% accuracy. Whereas if we tested the model on 20 new people, then we got uh, a 7% drop in accuracy. So here again, we see the lack of robustness uh, of this uh, handwriting recognition model to what one would consider as natural change. Surely you are not training a handwriting recognition model to deploy it on the same set of people on which it was trained. So the previous two examples were that of discrete prediction or classification tasks. Here we had a third experiment where we did for a regression-like task. So this task here was to forecast sales of um, different Walmart stores in California. This is a well-known data set on Kaggle. And we trained a model by casting it as a feature-rich regression task on data sets collected over 35 months from the period February 2013 to December 2015. And now when we tested the model on more examples drawn from the same period, we got a mean absolute error of 0 0.01. But when we tested the same model just one month away, say from January 2016, uh, we got an error of 17, uh, zero, 0 0.17. So such kind of lack of robustness uh, of uh, modern high performing otherwise machine learning models is the topic of my talk. And uh, we are going to worry about how can we train models to be robust to such natural changes. So the first, the first step is to look for change within, which means that instead of thinking of training data as one collection of identically distributed examples, we look for changes which come, around, uh, come about uh, for the same reasons as the changes we would see in the deployment setting within the training data itself. So with that uh, view in mind, we do not think of the training data as comprising of IID samples, but rather the training data itself is assumed to be uh, like comprising of multiple domains. So we view our training data as a mixture of uh, a set of distributions where the mixture components are defined during when you create the training data based on domains and changes when you, the changes in data distribution that come about when we go from one domain to another is also the kind of change we can expect to see during deployment. So during training, we would like our model to be robust to the changes coming out of inter-domain variation. So, this is just a very simple uh, sort of uh, mindset shift, which we are going to exploit in many different settings 
to train the model differently. So no longer will we try to just minimize expected risk on the training data, but rather we will consider these groups in a special way during training to provide more robustness to change. So that brings me to the outline of my talk. So we are going to talk about two kinds of change. One kind of change which arises out of these groups or domains which change continuously along a real valued attribute, uh, typically say time. So here, uh, if you consider domain change or group change arising out of time, we can assume that the time of deployment or the time at which the training data was collected is known. Okay? So this is what we mean by the change domain is known. And the other uh, interesting feature of this setting is that during deployment, we would often be interested in a fixed future interval because after that we would want to retrain the model. Since we believe that there is some gradual shift which is happening a long time and you would need to periodically retrain the model. The second, which is the more challenging change that we are going to talk about in the second part of my talk is where we assume that the domains are def defined by some discrete uh, latent ID. And during training, we are just given this group of examples which have the same domain ID. And during deployment, because these are discrete or categorical domain IDs, the domain ID is not available. And we want to generalize not, so, not just to a fixed or a small set of known domains in the, in, uh, uh, during deployment time, but also to examples in the training domain. So these two give rise to slightly different challenges. And so first let's start and talk about this first setting where the changes happen because of an implicit latent uh, sort of continuous attribute. Sorry, it's not latent, it's observed. Okay. So, uh, so this setting is also, uh, you can think of it as a periodically retraining setting for models which have temporal drift. So examples of this setting is say, you know, when a re when an e-retail company is training recommendation models periodically, say every night, uh, and uh, it's using label data, which are typically say the user clicks of the previous day to train the model uh, the next night. So now we can think of the domains as coming out of the interval over which the models uh, over which the models are retrained. So you would have like say maybe label data from day one, day two, up to say some day T collected. And then you train a model and now you uh, deploy it the next day. And at the end of the day, you have the user clicks which gives you more label data and you would want to refresh your model. And so therefore, because you are going to be retraining at the end of day T plus one, we are only interested when we train, do this first training here to perform well in this closed interval. Now, this is an example, you can think of it as a domain adaptation problem, but it's not exactly a pure domain adaptation problem because we do not even have unlabeled data from this prediction interval. So it's basically zero shot adaptation. Now, uh, this problem uh, we are going to later apply on more complicated real life data set, but to understand the challenges and to evaluate different options for tackling such gradual shift along time, I am going to consider this synthetic data set, which is called this well-known two moons data set where uh, we assume that changes happen because of uh, rotation by 18 degrees in the counterclockwise direction when you go from say time one to time two. So you are just rotating 
this moons, you know, this blue moon is say positive label and the red moon is the negative label. So this is a two class classification problem in this with two features, very simple data set. And our goal is of course, to separate the positive points, which is the blue points from the red points. And uh, we have labeled data which uh, rotate by 18 degrees at every time interval. So we have been given training in data for say 19, and so for nine different rotations by 18 degrees each. So at the, and now we want to deploy it at the 10th time interval. So which means 18 times 10 uh, degree rotations, which means at the time of deployment, the, the points have been flipped around by 180 degrees. And uh, now if, if you see training data over these nine snapshots, can you do better than the default training if you know that you are only going to deploy the model at time snapshot 10, which means on images which have been rotated by 180 degrees, really. Okay. So uh, if you just apply the default training, the maximum likelihood estimation principle uh, based training that I just mentioned in the beginning of the slide, where you just treat the labeled data from the previous nine snapshots as IID samples, undifferentiated IID samples, and you train the model, you are not going to get a good um, decision boundary. So here you are seeing the decision boundary that comes about if you do such a training. So, so all the points in the shaded sky color regions will be labeled as blue and that incurs huge errors on this uh, red points here. And also in this part here, we have missed out some blue points. And if you look at this decision boundary carefully, you will find that it's basically optimized for the average rotation of the training data, which is around 90 degrees. So this decision boundary would perfectly serve points which are rotated by 90 degrees from the starting um, set of points. And naturally this gives you very poor accuracy when you deploy it on this 10th uh, timestamp. So we got get an accuracy of over 78% only. Whereas if you, I mean, this is a very simple data set. So if you actually drew samples from this last domain, you would get 99.9% .9 or even higher accuracy. So now we are going to see how we can bridge this gap. So of course, uh, practitioners, if they know that they are going to deploy the data tomorrow and they have a bunch of data collected, say from the past 100 days, they will not treat all 100 days of data the same way. They are going to give more importance to recent data. So we did the same thing also as the next alternative to try out. And this is actually a very established method, which is of aging. So you age away old or irrelevant data. And uh, we did that aging by essentially doing incremental fine tuning of the data a long time. So you first train a model with t equal to one, incrementally fine tune on t equal to two and so on. So that at the last step of fine tuning, you have used the most recent data and therefore you are best prepared for this next immediate time step. So when we did this um, sort of bias towards more recent data or aging or whatever you call it, we found that the decision boundary is much saner. Now, this particular decision boundary, for example, almost looks like what you would get if you just used this last time snapshot and uh, you get around 85% accuracy. So uh, now the question is why, is, why is it still so far from the close to 100% accuracy we could have gotten at t equal to 10? And one of the reasons is that the amount of recent data could be very small. Uh, and, you know, so that's the reason why you go to old data because, you know, more the merrier is the maxim now in modern day machine learning. So these are data hungry machines, but so are data hungry models. So you want to use as much data as you can. And that's what you lose out on when you do this kind of uh, recency bias. That's one problem. Uh, the second problem is that the future, in this case, uh, the distribution at time 10 may not be the same as the distribution in any of the training domains. And there is in fact almost a function um, like drift and you would actually like to capture that drift to train the ideal model. So that intuition was behind a, a method called C dot uh, for continuous um, 
optimal transportation methods for transporting uh, or mapping data distributions which are kind of related. So suppose if I think of what I have as a time one as one data distribution and a time two as a second data distribution. Now these are somewhat related. So there, there are well-known uh, theoretical and also practical algorithms backing it, which are called optimal transportation algorithms, which can map the data from t equal to, um, from time t to time t plus one. So these tend to be kind of, uh, although they are sort of imminently implementable, they tend to be expensive algorithms. So for example, we tried this optimal transport on two adjacent images. And here you see the rough outline of the overlay that we got when we, trans when we sort of transported some past data into some present data. And it does not look too bad. I mean, given that, uh, you know, machine learning, uh, deep learning models often benefit from pre-training with noisy data. This seems like it could work quite well. And uh, you could do it continuously. And when you did it continuously, we would get like some kind of an overlay of many different transportations along time. And when we do such transportation, and now we have been trained the model with this noisily transported data, and now the decision boundary seems uh, quite good. It seems to be tailored for the time at which the model will be deployed. And we also see a commensurate improvement in accuracy, like we go from 85% to almost 91%. Now, uh, sort of intuitively, it sounds like a great idea and uh, sort of makes a lot of sense, except that when you try to deploy it for more complicated real life high dimensional data sets, it does not work very well. We spent like almost six months trying to have some variant of this trans data transportation or slash generative approaches to work where we would just sort of transport the data a little bit a long time, but uh, the accuracy was not enough to give us gains in the downstream classification task. So then that uh, got us to a second viewpoint, which is that, you know, since neural networks are also powerful, can we sort of just let the network handle the evolution of the decision boundary along time by just providing time as an additional input with the X. So normally we have been saying that we will train a classifier function F, which takes as input an X. But since we expect the distribution X to change a long time, we will change my decision function to take as input both X and T. And so now my input is a concatenation of X and the timestamp at which the X was collected. And I train a general neural network for this. Uh, surprisingly, this method did not work very well, even for the simple two moons data set. And then we realize that you need to provide some more inductive bias to the network to train um, sort of the correct kind of sensitivity towards time. So there were two main changes we did, which uh, finally gave us uh, much better results. One is that instead of providing time as say, just a single real value, we embed time is as a vector using um, sort of a time to vec function, which is like the kind of um, posi position encoding, which are used in modern transformer models. Essentially, you take a real value and you, um, you, know, and you extract different uh, frequencies of that value so that you can capture different kinds of uh, sort of um, seasonality based induced similarity along different time points. So we take the re single real time as input and convert it into a vector using time to vec. And now the second uh, interesting change, which was also very significant uh, in getting good results, was to make selectively some of the parameters of the network a function of time. So in particular, we found it useful to make the activation threshold of uh, the ReLU functions, which are all over in uh, neural networks, uh, to be a function of time. So normally you have like a single uh, parameter for each ReLU, which controls the point at which it 
snaps to zero. But now we make that threshold be a function of time. And our idea intuitively was that when you have like say, uh, you know, small changes along time that would just require you to just shift the decision boundary in very small steps. And that um, you want to do at all layers of the neural network. And that led us to the design of a new unit, which we call the t relu unit, where the thresholds and also sort of the, the leaky part, you know, you don't want to directly decay to zero, but you decay at a flatter rate. The, both of these parameters are made a function of time. And the, the, the network which learns the how should the threshold change with time has parameters phi, which are trained end to end with the rest of the network. So this is basically our special time sensitive network. And when we train the model with this time sensitive network, we get a much saner behavior. And also this is something we will soon see will work for uh, many different real life data sets also. And we've got a very decent uh, improvement in accuracy. Even on this toy data set, we went from 90.7 to 96 almost percent accuracy. But even for this method, we found that uh, because neural networks have such high capacity, it's very easy for them to overfit on the uh, specific discrete say times, so not discrete, but say whatever, suppose if you have trained your model on say, say five time snapshots, then the neural network can learn five different decision boundaries for each of these five, five snapshots and just generally not bother to generalize beyond that. So in other words, the neural network can overfit on the training times and there is no guarantee that the network will generalize to future time. So on this data set, maybe you don't see so much of that effect, but we will see on other data sets that this is a real thing. And uh, now uh, in general, you know, training neural networks with time sensitive parameters where you control how smooth the sensitive, the, the smoothness with which the parameters change along time. This has been studied uh, by a few papers in the past. Uh, Adagraph is one such uh, work which tries to use kernels to smooth, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, some time sensitive parameters along uh, uh, time. Uh, another papers, uh, another set of uh, works try to use Gaussian processes to kind of smooth the decision boundaries along time. So the, the it, you know, these uh, sort of work in some settings like the Idagraph method works for images and the Gaussian process method just works for regression models, but it's not something that would work horizontally across the board, across many different data modalities. And so we wanted to look for more gener you know, generically applicable training paradigms to handle time sensitivity without overfitting on time. And that led us towards uh, gradient smoothing based methods. So instead of, uh, instead of uh, you know, uh, regularizing through standard, you know, you know, early stopping and all that, we added uh, a regularization on the norm of the gradient of the decision function along time. So here you have uh, like so now your training objective consists of two parts, the normal say cross entropy loss or maximum likelihood uh, uh, estimation, whatever you view it as. And then there is this regularizer which tries to impose a norm on how fast this network can change along time. So here we have used the L2 norm and you have the standard, uh, you know, parameter, hyperparameter to control the importance of the two parts. So when we tried this uh, gradient smoothing method uh, on even this uh, Totu Moons data set, surprisingly, uh, even though the decision boundary was smooth, we found that the performance was not so great. And we got like only 89%, even with very heroic attempts at, at trying to tune the Lambda well. So uh, that uh, basically got led us to a final method. And I promise this is the last method variant I'm going to talk about, which is our proposed method, which we are calling as a training with 
gradient interpolation loss. So let's try to spend some time to understand the method. So the first part just is the standard loss that you might have on the prediction and the true label Y. But the second part also is a loss between the true label, but instead of the predicted logit, we get a first order Taylor expansion of the logit along time. So if we want the F theta to be a smooth function of time, it should be well approximated by its gradient using this formula. So here we are saying that this X was observed at time T, but I am going to compute its logit by shifting this X to some point T minus delta. And then I am going to add the delta times the gradient of the function with respect to time. So essentially this is computing the, the predicted value for X by using a first order Taylor expansion of the F X comma theta function along time. So now this is also a kind of regularization like what we had earlier, but the difference is that the amount by which you are allowed to you know, dampen the gradient so that this first order Taylor expansion holds is supervised by the true label Y. So essentially I think of it as supervised smoothness. It's a kind of regularization, but the regularize, regularization is smoothed by the Y. Okay. And uh, if you think about it uh, another way, so the delta in our case could also be negative. So when you put delta as negative, and if you think of the time t as the last training time, then you are allowing the model to be extrapolated from a future time. So you are shifting a data example that you have at current time to the future, calculating the logic in the future, and then you know, extrapolating or interpolating it to the present time. And uh, we choose the delta adversarially, like in many other methods which we follow adversarial training. And uh, this is what we call as training a time sensitive network with GI loss. So now you train the same model, but in addition to the point, you also give the timestamp as input and you impose the GI loss and the decision boundary turns out to be quite sane. And even um, for this simple data set, we get a 0.6% improvement in accuracy. And uh, this is finally our method of choice. So here are some more experiments uh, on more data sets. We experimented on uh, say four classification data sets and uh, three regression data sets uh, from many different uh, modalities. So here, these two are time series data set. This is a regression data set about house prices. ONP and ELEC2 are two um, classification data set with discrete labels where we actually uh, sort of uh, study the uh, behavior a long time. And the first two continue to be synthetic data set. And here we have compared against many different methods. Uh, each uh, row here is a different method. GI is our last method. Adagraph, CDA, C dot. Some of these I have talked about. And uh, for others, you have to look at um, sort of uh, my references in the slides. And uh, we find uh, it. So what you see in this table here is error values. So for classification, uh, for this uh, uh, four classification tasks, we are showing classification error. So lower is better. And uh, here for this three regression tasks, we are showing mean absolute error. And we find that in all cases, it really helps to train your model by being sensitive to time. So even, you know, if you, even if you forget about comparison with all other existing approaches, I would just say, just look at the default, which is the baseline method. Compare the baseline method with what you would do by you know, doing this to what you would get if you just sort of made your network time sensitive and added this GI loss, you know, the amount of reduction in uh, error that you get out of that. And that is uh, significant. 
So, uh, so in summary, what I have presented is two techniques to prepare your network for future drift. One was to use a time sensitive network that allows you to use all the data rather than employ decision recency bias and retire out old data and to supervise the time sensitivity of the network by using simple gradient interpolation laws. And these two simple ideas have pro provided us much better results than um, more elaborate data transportation and other generative methods. And now I'm going to quickly go over the second setting where the domains are discrete. So, so, so these are the applications where the general uh, discrete domain setting arises. So you have domains coming out of uh, accents, which typically come out of the region from which a person is, and you have trained your model on a set of accents and you want to generalize it to accents of other regions or in the handwriting recognition task where each person is a domain and you of course want to generalize to new people during deployment. So this is uh, more crisply the problem formulation. During training, we have labeled data over a subset of domains so now our label data can be thought of as comprising of the input X, the label Y and the domain ID. So during training, we know the domain ID and these domain IDs come from a subset of K domains. And we would want to deploy the model to perform well, not only just from more examples drawn from the same domain, like from the accents on which the model has been trained, we of course want to perform well, but also on new accents or new people, which we are denoting as DK plus one to DM. So, uh, and during when we are deploying the model, we do not have domain ID. Domain ID does not make sense because it's categorical. And this problem is actually a, a known as the domain generalization problem in the machine learning literature. And many different methods have been proposed. I'll just give you an overview of the three main methods which have been proposed in, for this problem. So one method is domain erasure kind of methods, which are also called domain invariant learning kind of methods, where you try to train your network. So suppose you have this network which takes a X as an input and it uh, computes a, a vector representation of X, which is the last hidden layer H, and on top of which it applies a softmax to produce a label Y, or it does, um, and now what you want to do is to make sure that this age does not contain any domain specific information. So if the if the last layer vector which is used for classification does not contain any domain specific information, then it is expected to trivially generalize to new domains. And you achieve this target of H not containing domain specific information by having a separate domain adversary network and you train the model in some kind of a two player game setting like what has been used for GANs. But actually, even though this idea sounds very intuitive, it does not work very well in practice. And uh, here are some reasons for it. So one reason is that the neural network could overfit on the training domains. And also the accuracy of the network on the training domains might suffer when the domain and label are not easy to separate. And the training itself can be very difficult when you think about this two player game setting. A second category of approaches are what are called data augmentation approaches. So these are very useful when you have uh, applications like say domain change arising out of fonts um, where the label and domain are so badly disentangled uh, that it's very difficult to separate out the domain from the label. So in such cases, uh, you know, the data augmentation type of approaches try to augment the training data with examples which have been perturbed along directions of domain change. So uh, there is a algorithm that we had proposed which appeared in ICLR 2018, which is called cross gradient training, which achieves this. So I will not have time to go get into details of the cross gradient training. And I just want to say that using the data augmentation approach, we got uh, a decent improvement in accuracy. Essentially you are you know, augmenting your training data with examples which have been perturbed slightly based on uh, the directions which you extract using a separate network of domain change. Uh, 
Now, a limitation of this method is that the domain classifier, uh, which we use for extracting the directions of domain change may not be perfect. And that allows us to make only very conservative operation uh, augmentations. And because of that, even though the network does generalize better compared to the baseline, the amount of gains that we get is kind of modest, as you will see on these uh, four data sets. So now this is the last method I'm going to talk about, which uh, is based uh, on some work which uh, appeared in ICML 2020, which is this method, which is called the common specific decomposition method. So here again, we go back to our goal of training a decision function, which is domain invariant. Uh, but we do not try to achieve that domain invariance by trying to wipe out the domain using an adversarial network, which gives rise to difficult training objectives, but through a simpler method, which is based on factorizing the, the training objective. Uh, so the last softmax layers, we factorize into some parameters which are shared across all domains and some parameters which are domain specific. And Additionally, we impose an orthogonality loss between the shared parameters and the domain specific parameters, and we train the network. And finally, during uh, deployment, we only retain the shared parameters. So I'm sorry that I could not explain this part very well. I encourage you to look at the paper for a better understanding of uh, this method. So this method actually works quite well in practice compared to many other uh, proposed methods. And here are some results, which I not have time to go into, but let me just jump to the summary. So essentially for, uh, you know, if you want to generalize to new categorical domains, you want to look at the domain generalization literature and the CST algorithm is one recent method which uh, we proposed. And it's a very simple way to do domain generalization. And the runtime of this method is just 10% more than what you would do if you just use default uh, MLE or ERM training. And uh, other, most other approaches are significantly slower. It's very practical and easy to implement. But the downside is that it may not be so great for in-domain data, but we feel that it's possible to design hybrids, which will be good both for in-domain data and for out-domain data. So in summary, what I would like to say is that uh, the MLE training objective only ensures generalization when the data distribution does not change after training. Now, if you want your model, uh, which you are letting out in the wild, to be prepared for natural change, you have to exploit your training, the multi-domains that are present already in your training data. You should not look at your training data as IID samples, but rather as a collection of groups of uh, uh, data of instances. And within, once you have identified the groups, if you want to handle gradual drift along time, the simple gradient interpolation loss over time sensitive networks is a good method to consider. And uh, for uh, unknown discrete shifts, the simple factorization of softmax parameters might help you be uh, more robust to domain change because it tries to make the decision boundary domain invariant. So what next? Uh, we would like to see these uh, methods that we have proposed over the last few years applied in larger real world settings. You know, now, you know, currently uh, there is a lot more work in this area. People are worried about how to enforce fairness, you know, how to make sure that the worst case group accuracy is not too bad, particularly when you have negative interference among groups and how to handle heterogeneity of domains during training. You know, domains might be heterogeneous because of varying amount of label data, varying proportion of labels, and varying amount of noise. Thank you very much. I have put the references. Thanks much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Sunita, for the very insightful talk. I think, wow, this is a very uh, dense and um, talk with a lot of rich and fundamental results. Uh, and, and, and thanks for uh, sharing all this uh, theoretical uh, results and, and all these insights. Now, um, I'm, <clears throat> I don't see questions right now from the Rocky Chat channel, but I think, um, oh, there's one question popping up. So there's one question, um, one of the attendees curious if CSD works for multilingual, uh, is it treating each language as a domain? Do you have any response to that? 
Yes, sure. So, um, so actually, if, uh, when you are talking about domain generalization, we assume that you don't know the domain ID at the deployment time. Typically, for multilingual applications, you know the language ID. So then you can do much better than what domain uh, generalization strives to do by wiping out the domain. So, uh, you know, uh, so when you have like a language ID, then maybe you can have like separate adaptation layers for each language. And a lot of work has been done in that space. But suppose if you're thinking of applications like say code switching, where you have sentences where the language ID is not available, then CST kind of methods could be quite useful. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the answer. Now, um, I want to ask, ask a more high level question. So you shared with us a lot of these uh, fundamental results. Um, can you elaborate a bit more on the application side? Uh, what kind of uh, data scenario uh, will be the best application of these models in terms of the change of the of, of this uh, input data? It's all over. Just now I was hearing a talk from a Google engineer, and this is like one of their biggest problems, handling change during deployment scenario. And, uh, you know, I talked about uh, model drift. You know, everybody, you know, for the past, I have been doing machine learning and uh, KDD kind of thing for the past 20 years. Uh, you know, people have been talking about the problem of domain drift for a long time. You know, people have been using ensembling techniques and people have been figuring out how often they should retrain their model. So I just cannot stress enough about the practical usefulness. It's just all over, you know, as, uh, you know, life progresses, the data changes, models need to change. And I think we don't do enough of it. Thank you. Thank you for your beautiful yeah. talk and answer. All right. So uh, in the interest of time, I think, um, you know, we can, uh, if the audience have more questions, you can always interact with the Sunita offline. And thank you again for the nice talk. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Yeah. It Thanks. was fun. Yeah. yeah. Please enjoy bye. KDD. Yes. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.